Welcome back, my structural analysis friends. In our last video, we were starting our introductory course into influence lines, which were ways of being able to figure out the maximum effect of loads as they moved across a beam. Showed you a unit load concept and the equations and the steps necessary to solve a variety of relatively simple problems. But in all those cases, the structures were statically determinate. Today, we're going to look at a method known as Mueller Bruss Law, which is going to show us how to be able to generate the shape of an influence line diagram very quickly without having to go through all of those steps. So without further ado, let's get started. So qualitative influence lines are basically a way of drawing an influence line without coming up with the numerical coefficients that go with them. In our last video, we showed how, you know, if you had a coefficient of 1.5 for an effect at a location and a load of 10 kips, you just multiplied that coefficient by, by the load. Now, in today's modern age, where we use a lot of computer modeling, we're more interested in making sure that we capture the worst possible case or the, the the extremes and so influence lines can help us generate the load patterns to be able to do stuff by telling us where to put load maybe not telling us the, the the size of the effect but it allows us to then use tools such as computer programs software structural analysis programs that will then be assured of capturing one of the worst cases now again as you're analyzing a structural model you're looking at a bunch of different cases and you never know well, you seldom know which one is going to be the worst one uh, that produces the, you know, the maximum effect or the minimum effect or something like that. But we want to make sure that we get our list so that it is one of those possible. Now, the method that I'm going to show you is fairly dated. It um, goes all the way back to 1886 by a guy named Heinrich mueller Breslau, and It's known as the mueller Breslau principle. And basically, he stated that the influence line for a function, such as a reaction, a shear, or a moment, is to the same scale shape as the deflected shape of the beam when the beam is acted upon by the function. Now it's a lot of wording that's kind of confusing so we're going to kind of give you a couple of simple examples to hopefully illustrate what it is that we're talking about here. Okay the basic premise that it boils down to though is these two points all right basically if you're looking to study the effect of a reaction or a shear you're going to be installing rollers and if you're looking for moments we're going to be installing hinges because shear is related to displacement and moments are related to rotation. And so these are the effects that we're going to look at. All right, so we'll start off with something very simple to kind of illustrate the process. So suppose that I'm looking to do the reaction for, say, the, the load at A. Okay, it's a simply supported beam. It's pinned at A. It's roller at B. All we're going to do is, is we're going to install a roller at this location. And if I'm looking for a reaction in the upward direction, then I need a vertical roller. And what happens is because these are free to rotate, because a pin is free to rotate as well as a roller, when I go and I push this thing up a certain amount, then the shape looks something like this. You can see the dotted line would be the deformed shape. And we're assuming that the beam doesn't flex, in this case because it's free to rotate at these ends, so there is no bending that occurs in this. Now when we get to some of the, some of the bigger examples um, later on, then we'll have to take that into consideration. But for now, that's the, the premise of what we're doing. And the thing that we know is we know that if I put my unit load here in the amount of one kip from last time, we know that the coefficient on this diagram is going to be 1.0. Okay, and whereas if I'm looking for the effect at A and I put the load over here at B, then we know that the coefficient would be zero. And you can see that that's what's happening is I'm getting a 1.0 here and a zero here. And then likewise, if I go in the middle, it's half and half and so forth. And so you can see that that's what we mean by moving this function along and generating the coefficients for this particular shape. So it's, so it's very, very straightforward. Now, sometimes it's a little puzzling to kind of figure out what's going on, but we'll show you how powerful this method is as we start to move into some of our more extreme examples. Okay, so that's how you handle a reaction for shear. So let's go down and look at one for a shear case. Suppose I want to find, I have what looks like a cantilever beam on this, and I'm looking to find the shear, the internal shear at this point C on this. Okay, so we're pinned at this location and we want to call it B and then we're roller at D that's fine okay and what you do on this case is basically you install two rollers 
to reveal the shear, I have to cut it. So I'm going to put a roller on this left piece, and I'm going to put a roller on the right piece. And then based on our sign convention for, for our positive shear cases, you can see that when we're on the left side, we're going to be acting down, and on the right side, we're going to be acting up. This is that beam sign convention that we talked about with shear moment diagrams. And all I do is with these rollers is I basically apply this shear to the left, which is going to force this point here down. Okay. I know that I'm at zero here. So this whole thing just basically pivots about that fulcrum. And so if this point goes down, then this one has to go up. Okay. And assuming that there's no flexing of this, that it means a straight line. And so I can figure out, you know, what these values are based off of their positions. Now, Unlike the reaction that we had where I knew that this coefficient would be 1.0, this is not. Because remember, when we talked about shear last time, it was the difference between the high and the low that set up the 1.0. Now, so we've done the left side. Now do a turn around and do the same thing on the right side of the cut. And so I'm going to take this point and I'm going to push it up some amount on here. And so then what happens is, is that this point goes up and this point is zero because it's a support. And then we just basically connect the dots again. There is no internal shear effect. If I put a load directly over the support, there is no shear felt here. And likewise, if I put it over this support, there is no shear. So that's why these diagrams, these, these support conditions start to become boundary conditions for us for these internal effects. And so we always come back to zero coming across the support. And we'll take advantage of that idea as we start to get into even more and more complex, complex ideas. Okay, so if we look, then we can come in and we know that the... Um, that the difference between the high point and the low point is going to be that 1.0 difference. So if I'm sitting in the middle, this guy will be a half, this guy is a half, and then I can start to come up with proportions. And you can quickly see that if I know this value, and I know this is zero, and I know the distance, then I can use proportions to pull off what this value is. Okay, and it's nice because I don't have to do any of that free body diagram stuff or equation writing, you know, that we tried in the last time. So mueller brussel is a very, very powerful technique. Because again, you know, in this particular beam, if I'm designing for the shear of the beam and I want the maximum positive shear value, and I can come in and put distributed load anywhere along the length of the beam, the maximum positive shear case occurs when I load from here to here because that area is positive. And when I load from here to here, this area is positive, but I do not load the negative region. So these two will get me the maximum positive value here. So that would be one of the load cases that you would put in to analyze this beam if you're worried about shear at that location. Okay, and then likewise, if I want the negative, then I would load just from here to here in this negative area right there, and I would not load the positive. So these positive negative signs become very, very important to kind of look at those kind of things. So, so that's kind of the approach for what we're doing for shear and reactions. I can go and I can do the same thing for moments. Okay, but now instead of installing a roller, we're going to come in and put in a hinge at the location. So again, a very similar beam. I have a cantilever on the left, a cantilever on the right. Okay, and then it's simply supported in between. Um, I'm going to be looking for point C and what's happening here. And so the idea is, is that I'm going to install a hinge at the point of interest. I'm basically I'm going to release the rotation, and then I'm going to apply a positive moment, if you will, to this, such that you know again this is our positive sign convention for for the moments, such that I apply enough moment that causes a unit rotation of theta equal to one at this point. And so when I put the moment on here like this, and this is free to rotate, this point is going to come up. Okay, now, this does not come up to 1.0. It's going to, in fact, come up to some other, some other value. And we'll show you how to calculate those coefficients um, in a later video as we get there. But we know the shape. So this point comes up, and then again, I'm zero at the supports. And if this is up and that's zero, this guy goes down. And likewise, if this goes up and this is zero, this guy goes down. And so now very quickly, if you're looking to study the positive moment effect of the moment at C, then I know that that's what we're going to look at now. I, that should not be a 1.0 on that. All right. And so I know that to get that maximum positive effect, I would load between the supports, but I would not load the cantilevers. And that kind of makes sense, right? If I push down in the middle of this beam, it's going to want to bow downward. But if I start to push down on this cantilever, it's going to go down, but it's going to force the middle to come back up, which is counter to what it is, the effect that I'm looking for. And so those are the basic premises of what we're starting to look at for influence line using mueller Breslau. So, so those are our basic, uh, basic cases. All right, so let's try a couple of examples of some, a uh, few more complex type of problems. So the first one I'm going to do is this beam here. 
Okay, so what we have is we have a beam that is fixed at this end. Okay, it has a roller at this location and we're gonna install a hinge here. Okay, such that the hinge is located at a distance of 10 feet. A little bit where you can see, there we go. Uh, uh, 10 feet and so it's in the middle of the beam and then we have a cantilever that's also five feet. And again, this is fixed at this location. So suppose we wanna find the shape of the influence diagram for the re vertical reaction at A. So we're gonna be looking for AY, which is this guy, right? So if that's my AY. Okay, so according to our rules for reaction, we're gonna install a vertical roller to replace the effect of AY, and then we're gonna push this point up. Okay, so we know that when I push this up, now here's the thing that's a little bit tricky, especially with these fixed supports. I've released the vertical translation, but I have not released the rotation. So if it's fixed, it's gonna maintain the same shape as I start to push this thing up. So if that's the case, when I take this point and I slide it up, okay, it's gonna go up to some value. Basically that straight piece is gonna to continue to be straight coming up here. So this remains straight because of the fix. And so by association, it then lifts this hinge, okay, which is what we're seeing here. So here's the old hinge location, here's the new. Okay, and so that point comes up. And then we play our game with the support conditions. Again, a support is always a zero value, which is what we have. And if this point came up and that point was zero, then this point comes down, which is all that we're kind of looking at trying to do. All right. So if we look at trying to see if we can figure out what some of the values are on this, well, we can. We know that at this location, when the load is at A, the vertical reaction is 1.0. Again, we're putting a unit load somewhere on this thing. So I have a one, and this is like what we were doing with the X. And last time we actually derived the equations of this. So this goes up to one. And so if it's a one here, then it has to be a one here. And now look at what happens. We have a 1.0 at this location. Okay? And I know that this is 10 feet. And I know that this distance is five feet and it passes through zero. And assuming that this beam doesn't flex at all, then one goes to 10 is the same as five going to minus a half as the proportions go. And so even though I didn't compute it, I did get the coefficient value here. And that's the diagram for the reaction at A. Now, once you have this laid out, you, and in some cases, like say, you can get these, these coefficients. Now, suppose I put a 10 kip load. I said, you know, I say, I want the negative effect on AY due to a 10 kip load that can be put anywhere. Okay, well then you would go find the largest negative value, which would be over here, which means your worst case is putting that load out here at the tip of this, and then it would be 10 times 0 0.5 would give me a five kip negative load on that reaction. And likewise, if I wanted to know where do I put uniform load to get the worst possible effect, I know that I would load everything that's positive. Okay? Or if I want the negative effect, I would load everything that's negative. And so very quickly, you can generate the load patterns based off of, of, of this. And again, we're not too worried about how to compute the numerical values more so than we are of getting the shape and knowing where to put loads to capture the load values that we're after. Okay, all right, so let's try another one. Let's take the same beam, and this time we're gonna look at the vertical reaction for E. Okay, so all we're gonna do is we're gonna put our reaction E on here, and, we're gonna, and we do have a hinge at C, and I'm gonna take this point and I'm gonna displace it up to 1.0 because at the location that I'm looking at, it's always 1.0 when the load is sitting over the top of E. So if this goes up to one, then relative to this, this is all one piece, but there's a hinge here. So this goes up to one, the hinge is zero. And so this thing basically just kind of rotates up. And so we can come in and say, well, that's 10 feet. Okay, and this is five feet. So 10, one goes to 10 is the same as 1.5 goes to 15. Okay, and so and then over here, we actually have a zero value. So what's happening on this particular beam on this, because there's nothing that causes this to bend because I released that hinge. This hinge, um, and it's the moment that allows forces to flow around through the beam from one side to the other. By releasing that moment here, because the value of a moment at a hinge is zero, there's nothing going on in this band. So if I put a load here, there is no reaction felt over here. Okay. Whereas if I put it on this area, then I do feel it. We start to kind of look at it there, and that's how you start to get the reaction for EY. Okay. So all, um, and that's also how we can build up our coefficients using these proportions like we talked about. So qualitative influence lines can very quickly allow us to figure out load patterns. And in simple cases, statically determinate type structures, we can actually come up with the numerical values. 
But where the power of this method really starts to shine is in the area of indeterminate structures. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of the, the process. It's gonna use a lot of the same thoughts and ideas that we had in the, the earlier examples. But let's take a look and see what happens when I look at, say, something like a continuous beam, a multi-span. So in this case, I have four spans on this. Okay, and so we'll start off. So suppose I wanna look at then the influence factors for BY, which would be the, react, the vertical reaction to B. So I have A, B, C, D, E, and then I actually have a point F. It's here in the middle that we'll look at what happens with, with the moments in the shears. But let's start out with something simple, kind of applying the concepts that we had for the vertical reaction at BY. So just like we did before, we know that I'm gonna take this location, take the reaction, and I'm gonna displace it in amount 1.0. Okay, now, what happens in a, in a continuous beam is, is that now, it's, you know, it's, we're getting some flexing effect in this, okay? That the beam is fighting us as we try to push this thing up. So instead of being straight line segments for, for, the, for, the, re, for the, the section, we can look at then saying, all right, well, what do we know? We know that at the supports, they're all zero. So I would put zeros in here, and I know this is zero, and I know that it's gonna wanna bend, it's not gonna be straight, it's gonna kinda curl itself back in to this point. And so I come in, you know, so if we go, let's go to the left first. So it's gonna curl itself back to the point that it wants because we're kind of flexing it. It's being held on the ends, okay? And so I get some sort of slope as it comes into that, into that pin and it's a, it's a non-zero value. Now, when I do that, so that's my 1.0. And then likewise on the other side, coming into this support, this end wants to kind of slope back in and do this. And so what we do for the continuous structures is we know that this beam was originally straight. On one side, it had a certain slope, and on the other side, it had the matching slope. It was continuous. It didn't just all of a sudden bend itself or have a kink or you know a, a disruption in the, in the shape of the beam. It was one continuous straight beam. So the same idea is gonna have to happen here, that if it's coming down at this location, then on the other side, it has to do the same thing, right? And so this beam is, as it comes into the support, it continues past at the same angle, Okay, but now it's got a trajectory that's kind of taking it down here, but we know we have another support that this is gonna to wanna to curl itself back up. So this thing is gonna bend back up this way. And so you can start to kind of see faintly these, these dotted lines that are coming into effect here. And then this becomes, there's my slope here, which has to be matched by a slope there. And you can see that it starts to do this kind of seesaw kind of effect, if you will. That comes across here and then it's going to and so now we're going positive with the trajectory taking me here but this support's going to pull us down so it's going to curl to come back around like that and so very quickly we know that to get the the worst case loading for this reaction at b i would load so this is a positive this is a positive that's a negative this is a positive and you notice that it starts to alternate so if this had more spans the next one would be negative and the one after that is positive and so forth and so on. Now again, we're not worried about the values. The only value on this diagram that I know is the 1.0. This may or may not be something smaller, it depends. Typically what happens is as this goes up, these get smaller the further out that you go, but not always, but not, not always. Okay, and in some advanced structure cases, um, when you learn things like slope defection method or, or those kind of approaches, then you'll learn actually how to calculate these coefficients or these effects further out. But for now, all we're looking at is trying to figure out where do I put the load that gets me the maximum reaction at B. So if I could put distributed load anywhere on this beam, I would put either side of the reaction that I want, and then I would alternate. I would go off, on, off, on, and so forth. And I could do the same thing going the other direction very, very quickly. And that's how I can get the reaction for this one. Very, very, very simple. All right, so let's go take a look then at same beam. Now let's look at the moment at F and apply our principle there. If you remember, the principle was you install a hinge, at this location and then I put my moments okay and when I do that this point goes up and so then this now this one is allowed to kink so it's going to remain fairly straight coming into the support okay and so you know it did this on either side of it because we allowed it to rotate we disrupted it by putting that hinge in there whereas up here we didn't okay so from here down to again zero at the support straight line trajectory is here and so it wants to continue on Okay, and then we wanna come back to zero, and so then it comes and it curls in. So we have a negative region here. Okay, we have a positive region here, positive region here, and then from this point to here, that's a zero, straight line, continuing. And you can see you can build these things really, really quick. And so then this wants to curl back up, 
to come into the zero value at the support and then here. And then likewise, it's now got a trajectory up here that it's gonna to wanna to curl back down. And so then you get the same alternating pattern, if you will. Okay, so the span of the moment that I'm looking at, and then it alternates as we start to go through. Very, very easy, very, very simple. Again, I'm not worried about the coefficients. In fact, on the moment, you don't know the coefficient. I just know that it went up and I know where to put the load. And this is where we'll count on things like structural analysis programs and software models to be able to actually compute the effects, the actual numerical values. But I need to know that in the model that I build or I put into the computer software, that I have to load, give it a load case of load this band from B to C and then from B to E in order to capture the positive effect here, the maximum positive in this band. And likewise, I would, if I wanted the negative, I would load here and here. So you always have the two cases that you're looking at. Okay, and then we can go in and we can look at then the shear. Same concept, we're going to do the shear at F. Okay, and remember you install a vertical roller. Left side goes down, right side goes up. And so this point comes down to here. And so that's, but we're still zeros at the support. And so this gives me a straight line coming in. Okay, which then continues. And then that starts to curl back down to here. And then this side goes up. So it goes up to here. And so that gives me a straight line coming in to the zero here which then continues past, and you can see how you can quickly start to construct these things. It's very, very simple, and it's very, very easy to do as we start to kind of look at it. But again, the same kind of ideas for what you install for mueller Brussel are all applicable for us on this location. Okay, and so now the shear is kind of interesting, though, if you look at it, right? Let's suppose I want the maximum positive shear. I would have a positive here, and I would have a negative here, and I would have a positive here. So clearly the positives would get loaded, but look at what happens in the span at the shear. This is a negative, so I wouldn't load that portion, but this is a positive, I would load that. So you would load the right side of the point all the way over to the next support, okay, but you would not load the left, and that will give you the maximum positive shear value, okay? And then it does that alternating thing. So, all right, so now we can go in and we can go one step further. So we did continuous beams earlier. Now let's take a look and see, well, what happens to frames applying the same idea? Now, the one thing that we have to... To, to remember as we try to apply this idea to frames is that is the concept over here of rigid joints and basically that a joint maintains its relative position to all the beams and columns that come in. So if I have say a column and a joint and a beam coming in at 90 degrees before, then after, you know, if there's any rotation at this joint that it rotates as a unit, but that 90 degrees is maintained. And that will be the key to getting our shapes figured out on those, whether it's so all you know, whether it's four members or two or whatever the case may be, All right? So let's take a look and suppose I want to find the moment then at location J, All right? So we're going to play the same game. I'm going to put in my, my unit moments. I'm going to install a hinge and I'm going to push this point up. Okay, and then we just basically start with the beam for the four that we're on. This is exactly a continuous beam like what we just did. This comes down to zero and so my beam is coming here. Okay, and then if I look, if we maintain this idea of the joint behaving, well, this was horizontal and it rotated up here, so then the, col the column has to turn and do something like that, okay? And then likewise, over on the other side, it comes down into this and it maintains continuity going across, and then my column has to turn in response, but it basically, it changes, you know, from what was a plus shape, it rotates as a unit to be able to build up our shapes. And then again, trajectory brings me back to zero here. Again, we're assuming that the columns do not shorten, that there's no axial deformation, but the process is exactly the same. Right now, the next step then is, well, what happens on the floor up above? So right now we've got a positive in this region and I have a negative in this, okay? And so this column wants to come to here, and if we assume that there's no lateral drifting in this, this thing has a trajectory that takes me out here, but we know that it needs to come back into this shape. Okay, so this thing is gonna curl up to here. Okay, and so that would be the line that comes with this one. And then likewise, on the bottom column, it's got a trajectory that sends it down this direction, and we know that it's being fixed at the support, but the support is kind of fixed. So this thing kind of curls in and then eventually comes in vertically. So it's not quite a true bow like what you saw here. It's still maintaining the fixity of the support at the bottom, but it does curl back in and you can get the shape. Now, most of the time, we're not worried about the columns because typically in a structure, columns are not directly loaded with load such that it would cause this to, to push left or right, depending on how a structure is framed, of course. So, so most of the time we're not worried about that. There are cases where you might be concerned, but for purposes of this seminar and this class, we're not gonna be worried about the effect of the columns, right? And so if I look at, say, the top column here, it came in at that direction here. 
Well, it was 90 degrees, which means that the beam had to come down as a result. Again, we're maintaining the joint. It's moving the system. And now we play the same game so that when this joint comes down, trajectory here, it comes back to zero. So that gets me to here, and then it goes up. And you can see how we can quickly start to construct all of this. And then this one has a trajectory up. It now wants to come down over to here. And so we had a positive. This is a negative, And this is a positive. And if you had bigger structures, then you can very quickly start to, start to lay this thing out. Okay, and so to get the maximum effect here, I not only load the span on the floor that I'm looking at, but I also load the span on the floor above, and technically the floor below would also do the same thing for positives um, in those cases. And so we get kind of this interesting looking checkerboard pattern that starts to develop as we start to kind of look at our system. Okay, and so very quickly you can construct these. Now let's just check to make sure that everything has worked out the way we thought it was. So on the roof, it, the beam was coming this way, which means the column has to kick out, okay? And so this point has to come back, and it wants to come back to zero, and it does come back in where it should, okay? So that's always a check. Now, there are some cases that you'll see in more complex framing systems where bays are not regular, where sometimes I get a beam that will, want, will have to reverse itself and form an S shape, but you'll know those when you see those, okay? But for now, that's what we're looking at. So again, we're not allowing this building to drift left or right. As indicated, I installed a roller here so that it wouldn't, it's free to rotate, but it just it won't drift left or right. So, all right, so that's how we can start to apply this for frames. All right, let's take a look at what ha happens with columns. Okay, so suppose I'm looking for the effects of the column at B, okay, for the reaction at BY. Okay, well, the idea that we did with this one is, is that to come up with a reaction, I took this point and I shoved it up an amount 1.0. Okay, now, if we assume that the column doesn't shorten, that the column maintains its length. When I take the bottom and move it up 1.0, point at E, the top of the column goes up 1.0. And then if this one goes up 1.0, then this guy goes up 1.0 also. Okay, and so that's how you would get this reaction on this case. Okay, and then we basically reconnect everything. So to get the worst possible loading for BY, then you know if I if I construct my lines, and again, it, it's gonna kind of curl back down to D here, and it's gonna curl back down to F here. Okay, so this is a positive, and this is a positive, and then likewise, this one does the same thing, so that's a positive, that's a positive. To get the worst loading on this, I load everything. Okay. Now, what happens if, um, now one of the things that kind of kind of interesting, if we look at the joint, let's take a look at this top joint. It came in here, and it turns that direction, and then this beam came in here, and so I know my column is doing this. This is one of those reversals that we talked about that this point wants to come to here, and this point wants to come to here, so this thing has to do kind of an S in order to get this point to come in. To, so there's kind of this double reverse curvature thing happening here on that particular column, and that happens on some of these. This column stays straight, this one gets an opposite curl, because it came in at this direction and was coming out that way, and this one was coming this way, and so we get kind of a curl that wants to come around that direction as well. Very, very easy. Again, there's no statics, no equation writing to this. It's just a matter of figuring out where do I put the loads, okay? All right, so we can come in and we can, you know, if you were to look at, say, at A, the same idea, what would happen is this column would go up a unit, and then you would get from here to zero, and then it would go negative, and you can very quickly generate these patterns for all of the different columns that we're, that we're worried about. It's um, load cases and load combinations on a structure get very, very numerous, and they get there in a hurry as we start to kind of look at that. Okay, so now let's go through, uh, try the same idea for shear. Okay, so same idea as what we just did. I'm going to install a roller at my point that we're calling as J. Left side goes down, right side goes up. So by now you're starting to see the pattern. Looks like that, zeros everywhere else. And so this guy comes down here. So we have a positive value and a negative value and a negative value there. Okay, and then we go in and we look at our what's happening with the column or our joints and so this one does this and so this guy is going to curl come back to zero and so that guy does that approach okay and so this one now wants to curl in to here okay and so we had our beam coming in doing this and you can see that okay well the column does this and the column does that so there's no curl it can get to the point that we want okay and then this is negative and then the, the problem that we have is is that this beam came this way Columns came this way, and this wants to get back to zero here. Okay, and if that's the case, now look at what happened on this upper beam. I have a line that wants to go up here, and this line wants to come down, so this one has to do a reversal here. 
Okay, and so you get a reversal in the beam. And it's kind of interesting because this is a positive and that's a negative. Okay, it's in the same bay, but it's on the floor above. So if I wanted positive here, I would load positive here for the right half, but on the floor above, then I would load the left half. And it's gonna alternate as you go up you know, to more and more stories when you start looking at shear. Kind of an interesting phenomenon. Okay, and then these guys are also gonna alternate. So this is a minus, this is a plus, and you can very quickly pull off the signs using Mueller Bress Law accordingly for those. Okay, all right. And then the last one I decided I'm gonna show you, we'll kinda of, kind of draw this fairly quickly. Let's do a moment at K because a pattern, a shape kind of shows up and we'll do this one together. So I'm gonna put this guy up to here. And so this is gonna come down, it's gonna continue over and come over that direction. And then this one's gonna come down to zero, continue on and then come back up to zero. Okay, and then we know that relative to this line, he does that. Relative to this line, this one does that for the joints. And you can see how quickly we can construct these with something kind of like that. All right, so everything here is a positive. This is a negative. This is a negative. Now let's go to the floor above. And this guy is going to come over back to zero. And so my joint does this. Okay, and so then this is going to want to come back to zero. And we're coming down, so we continue on. And so then this one comes over to here continues on and then my column does that and you can see how we can quickly start to lay these things in okay and then this is going to want to come back to zero like that and so the column wants to do this and the bottom of the column is doing this and you can see that i can do a single curve to get me there and you can see very quickly how fast i can build these basic shapes or let's see this oh whoops i've taken off my columns so let's get that line out of there Okay, and so this was, this column does this, and then continuing on, this guy comes down and does that, and this one comes down and does that, this one continues on, and so forth, and so on. And so very quickly, you can start to see, so it was minus here, positive here, minus here, positive here, minus here, positive there. Okay, and if you look, look at what you have. It's off, on or sorry on off on okay off on off it starts to form what looks like a checkerboard pattern in this case right so now here's the thing that's kind of interesting that this one case would give me the maximum moment here if i loaded all of these bays in a checkerboard type pattern but if i went up and did the same process on a moment at a point in this span your diagram would look exactly the same the loading diagram so by doing this checkerboard load pattern I capture all of the maximum moments and all of the beams at the same time um, for the maximum positives. And then if I want the maximum positive on this guy, well, then everything shifts over a bay and I get the checkerboard pattern off of that. But you can quickly construct these things. And so for two checkerboard cases on a structure, you know, these load patterns, I can get all of the maximum moments in the beams and the girders. Um, well, the girders in this case. Uh, very very easily when i go and plug it into my software analysis so the checkerboard on off becomes kind of a, a a special little trick that we look for so that's one there are two cases that you'll always have is this you know we think about you know you know multiple you know multiple system and the way that we look at this that if i if i load this one then i want to load this one and i want to load this one and i want to load this one and i want to load that one is kind of my pattern that i'm looking at that's what we mean by a checkerboard Okay, and then the one next to it, we get the, the exact opposite, if you look at it. So, so that's how we mean by on, off, on, off, on, off, and then so forth and so on. Most of the time, we don't do the floor because that's on the foundation and not in our structural framing well. So anyway, that's the basics of mueller bress Law. There are some other things that you can do with mueller bress Law for trusses and girders and some equations, and we'll talk about those in the next lesson. But this is a very, very important concept. It's kind of simple but it is so useful i use this probably more than just about anything else as i go to try to do um, my, my structural analysis modeling using software um, so anyway hope that made sense if you've got any questions please leave us a, some comments and some feedback down below be sure to like the video if you liked it found it helpful or useful at all and we will see you next time happy engineering